Wow. Hi, color. Wow. Wow, how? I haven't even put my hat on yet. <gasps> Wait, well, hey, I have a, I have the hair thing, like a hair thing. You should totally put your hair clip on. That'd be amazing. Where did I put it? I'm trying to think about it. <laughs> well, you know, I figure anything. Wardrobe is hugely important when it comes to these very, very significant meetings. <laughs> I, I have to, I try to think about where did I put it? So can Maybe I share my screen with you? Just to yeah, test it sure. out and make sure it works? Mm -hmm. Let me go ahead to make you the co-presenter so you can go ahead to. Yeah, I'm sorry it's dark in my office. You can't really see my face, but you can definitely see my ears. Your ear is definitely standing out there. All right, let's see if it works. I don't have any sound, so there we have it. I can move the chat. It should be good. I love it. Oh, you love it. <laughs> this is good. I'll see if I can move background. the video. <laughs> Where's the video panel? I got the video panel. Okay, so that's good. So I guess we can leave it on this screen maybe. What do you think? Yeah, it looks really good. I like it. I've got 75 oh. slides. Well, how many? How many? 75, seven five. Yeah, did I say it's a it's an hour session or did I say it's a four hour session? Like what what, what did I say? <laughs> well, I was gonna ask you how long do I have to talk to them? An hour or a half an hour? Uh, probably like forty minutes or so. Okay, that's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, I think a lot lot of sessions, a lot of pages of picture too, so it wouldn't be too. <laughs> yeah, I can move through the pictures pretty good. I don't have to do a lot of reading. Mm -hmm. I saw somebody just jumping here. Maria, Maria. Hi, Maria. Do you want to say hi? <laughs> We're here hi, to Maria. chat. Yes, I do, but my computer went nuts. Sorry. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? I can hear fine, you. Fine. Thank you. <laughs> How are you doing? We're we're really on time. Yeah, you're really on time. You're like uh, more on time. <laughs> which which where are you from? Can you tell us? From Colombia. I am. Colombia. I am. I work in the college consular and um, international programs of Colegio Los Nogales, the Bogota, Colombia. Okay. Wow. That's fantastic. How's the, how's the going down there, like, uh, do you guys starting like a vaccination process yet? Yeah, we started, but we are a little bit behind. We are just only, we have just vaccine, like they start with the elder ones and we are right now like, and with the health service. And right now we are like 4 million of vaccines just just for a million we're a little bit behind and they're telling us that uh some vaccines haven't arrived so the appointments are, get, are getting behind it's really frustrating but it's it, it will get there what kind of vaccine you guys are getting we're getting uh the seneca AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca. Yeah, AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca the uh, Pfizer, and we have the, I think we have just, I don't know if we had the Johnson yet. I don't recall. Yeah. Those are good ones too. It's a uh, vaccination in general is going to be like a pretty long process i was kind of amazed at how you know ohio is able to giving people who are about 16 years old already uh me and my husband just did ours like yeah i'm yeah. glad for you <laughs> yeah and we have actually on our campus we have a big uh, vaccination center that is available for anybody in the like uh, county in the portage county so it's kind of nice to have our students who are, if their students are arriving, they can stay, they will kind of get their vaccine ready and try to get that range really fast. 
Yeah. And which, which one did you have? We had Pfizer too. And we had a really bad side effect because for Saturday, we pretty much can't get up for a whole day. <laughs> It's it's a it's a, but it's a, you know it's still worth it. Afterwards, it feels really amazing. You know, really appreciate it when you have a healthy body too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do. Color, do you have an RSVP list for today, or <laughs> is Maria our only I guest? Know. I have 24 people on the list right now. And uh, uh, I wonder how many people are gonna be joining. We should wait, maybe can we wait for like maybe three more minutes or so? All of our friends from the Office of Global Education, good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, this is like the first time I see everybody from OGU is like, you know, normally, even if they're big sometimes, they were, you know, this is actually the first time I see everybody's drawing too. I'm here it's for because they all wanted to see the hat color. It is true. <laughs> yeah, I'm here for Kristen. I saw that and I thought, I bet Kristen Stasiowski is doing the lecture today. So I'm going to show up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really appreciate your fangirl status. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, also we realizing for this session, we actually have a lot of people register. And I was talking to Sama about it. She thinks because right now it's also when a lot of international high schools are getting students confirmation for their uh, the, the, the final selection of like schools. So it can be a little bit uh, like uh, overwhelming over there too. So that could be contributing to the reason why we have less people uh, registered. But the uh, we're still gonna send a recording to everybody who registered for this. And uh, you know, especially for people who had different timelines and we can also potentially do the sessions in the future too. That's what we love. We love recordings in the future. <laughs> I saw another lady join Diana Bahar. Bahar? Yes. <laughs> Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Uh, Can you introduce yourself pretty quick? Yes, of course. I'm Diana Bahar. I am the college counselor at Colegio Los Nogales in Bogota, Colombia. Oh, wow. I you work with that? Maria Alejandra. <laughs> What is it? What is it? What's the coincidence here? You know, we had two Colombia ladies here. Yeah, we work together. <laughs> Wait, do you guys work in the same office? In the same office, yes. Yeah, okay. we do. Awesome. It's nice to have you guys here then. And then I saw, I saw, I just want to say hi really quick to Marcos. Hi, Marcos. Marcos, Marcos, you're muted. And we can see you. Can you say hi really quick? Okay. I feel well, like hi, Marcos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe he doesn't want to talk to me. It's okay. <laughs> It's okay, color. It's a morning. Nobody wants to talk yet. Uh, do you want to go ahead and start? And then, uh, oh, oh, Marcos is um, just not muted. Hi there. Hey, how uh, are you? Asking everything too. Good, how are you? Good, Can you fine, talk a little you. bit about yourself? Sorry, I, I couldn't hear you. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Like, where are you from? Which, you know, which schools you're working with? Yeah, sure. Well, I'm actually from Brazil now. I'm talking uh, here in the capital, Brasilia. Uh, I work as a counselor and a principal at a high school here. Uh, we call Ginatus High School. We have probably 700 students now. And I work here as a principal and as a counselor here. I've been working as a counselor from since from 
2018, probably. So just okay. uh, two years. And um, I'm learning a lot of, about this. So awesome. that, that's why I am. Welcome to be here. You said you're in Brazil? Yeah, I'm in Brazil. OK, wonderful. Welcome to be here. Then we have uh, Aiki. Hi, Aiki. Can you introduce yourself really quick? Yeah, good afternoon. Good, good morning, good afternoon. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I really okay. have that word. It is afternoon here in Nigeria. <laughs> My name is Ike Nguke uh, from Lagos, this Corona Secondary School. Okay, welcome to be here. Thank you. Um, so, Kristen, I know you have a 75 slide. Do you want to go ahead and start? <laughs> <laughs> Thank so you, Color. I want to, yeah, I just, you know, get him, just give me one more second. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm just really honored you guys can be here. And I want to uh, introduce our star presenter, who's literally my, one of my favorite presenter, like a top presenter, I can state easily, you know, the top one presenter. She's like so enthusiastic when it comes to presentation. And you will really feel like it's a, you know, a great experience, you know, just listening to her talking about any topic. <laughs> she just somehow <laughs> make any topic so interesting. And uh, she's also a big fan of Disney, as you might see. And so let me just go ahead and pass the floor to Kristen. Thank you, Color. No pressure now for the expectations for this uh, presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so good morning, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I'm an assistant dean in the College of Arts and Sciences at Kent State University. And a lot of what I do is to try and help students identify why they're at university in the first place, what it is that they have to learn and what it is they have to experience and gain from being in a four-year university program as an undergraduate, what major then they should be considering, so what area of academic specialty, and then how that area of academic specialty can help them to develop a professional career and also personal satisfaction. So the presentation that I have put together for you today is a combination of a meditation on skill sets that students should receive when they're at a university like Kent State, majors that might be interesting to some of your students, and then the ways in which those majors pair well with the skill sets to give them a professional career. So we have skills, we have majors, and we have a career. But in the midst of all of this, the magic that connects it all, I think, are some examples of the way that certain Disney characters embody skill sets plus specialties and then success in their careers. So the presentation today will pair some famous Disney cartoons with what we think become very successful and magical student experiences at Kent State University. So to start us off, for those of you familiar with some Disney movies, you know that they usually have a life's lesson, right? So Cinderella encourages us to keep believing in our dreams, Stitch talks about the importance of family and inclusion that no one gets left behind. So that's friends as well. And then of course, Jiminy Cricket with Pinocchio, always let your conscience be your guide. So this speaks about achievement, this speaks about inclusion, and it speaks about consciousness, a way in which we could be morally and ethically taught. Disney also has many other lessons across the arc of their films, whether it's Rafiki and the Lion King, who we'll see in just a minute about how we reconcile our past, whether it's Elastigirl and The Incredibles talking about identity being important. Disney films tend to give us life lessons, right? So one might be tempted to think all you need to do is go to the cinema to be able to learn how to live your best life and to have a really important job. But that asks the question of, well, then what purpose does a university serve? And how can a university train our students to be successful like those great Disney characters? Are there life's lessons and lessons within disciplines that the university can at the same time convey to students? And I think there are. One of the main life's lessons and one of the main skills that a student can learn when at a university is how to have or find a voice, right? Teaching our students 
how to discover who they are, to imagine different skill sets, and then to be able to pay those forward in some way so that the world can hear their voice like Ariel's voice was heard in The Little Mermaid, very important. Of course, if they wanted to study linguistics or a language while they were at university, that would also be helpful because then they'd be able to speak multiple languages to allow their voice to reach many people. The other thing a university can do is show you a whole new world, like the film Aladdin, of course. And so being able to discover and encounter the newness of different cultures and different viewpoints is certainly something of a university's responsibility for our students. Of course, you could also be a geography major. It's important to know where things are and to know how things connect. So uh, that's something that we encourage our students to consider. We also, of course, think that study abroad is important. What better way to show you a whole new world than to actually be in it? And for your students already, coming to Kent State University is a study abroad experience outside of the nations uh, where they were born or perhaps have been living for a long time. Once they're here though, they can then also take advantage of Kent State's wide portfolio of other international programs. So a student from Nigeria could come to the United States through Kent State and then go say to Italy or to any other nation that interests them in their area of study. So there are many ways in which we can find a voice and see a whole new world. And thinking about those things, we tend to think that those qualities of mind are associated with something called liberal education or a liberal arts education, or put in another way, the humanities. And what's really central here, I think, and this is a great definition, so I wanna read it out loud. Liberal education is an approach to learning. So it's kind of an ideology, right? That empowers individuals and prepares them to deal with complexity, diversity, and change. So it's supposed to give students a broad knowledge of the wider world, science and culture and society, as well as an in-depth study in a specific area of interest, whether that be math or physics or chemistry or literature. A liberal education helps students develop a sense of social responsibility. We're part of a world community. How are we to get along with one another? as well as strong and transferable intellectual and practical skills. So communication skills, as well as on the job training. And you can see they highlight communication, analytical and problem solving skills. And we need to be able to find a way to apply our knowledge and skills in real world settings or contexts. So we happen to think here at Kent State University that we do this very well, that we give the students something specific in their area of interest, but something also broader that can go beyond those specific disciplines into the larger world and into a multitude of different career paths. And we like to call this special ability, this magical power, if you will, intercultural competence and knowledge, which is defined as a set of cognitive, effective and behavioral skills and characteristics that support effective and appropriate interaction in a variety of cultural contexts. So your students would be introduced to this right away, working perhaps in a non-native language and working within a university system in the United States different from those in their home nations. And it can be confusing to confront a lot of different behaviors or characteristics or cultures. As you see in this word cloud, things get very jumbled and you're unsure of how to communicate with people and how to really find your voice, find your passion, find your profession. And so I like to think that we can break all of those words down into these three different sections. Aspects of knowledge become important to you. So specific things that deal with language and awareness, a grasp of global issues. Skills become important to you. So listening and observing and having some patience and perseverance. And then attitudes. How do we demonstrate respect for one another? How do we embody openness toward other cultures and people? How do we be, develop our curiosity? That's something students today really need. And so, although it seems strange to see a Dean with a Mickey or mini hat on, the imagination is really important to being able to solve problems. That which we are able to know is far smaller than that which we are able to imagine, which is why Albert Einstein even said that imagination is more important than knowledge because knowledge is finite and, in, and imagination is infinite. So it's important also to use the imagination and engage the imagination when we're thinking about other people. One of the main ways we can do that to start with a skill set is to develop empathy. Empathy means that we've got to be able to experience the perspective of other people. 
and to look at the world through more than one viewpoint. And so that we can demonstrate an ability to act in a supportive manner that recognizes feelings of another culture or group. Empathy can be complex. And so I think one of the great definitions of it is the following. Empathy is the imaginary participation in another person's experience, including emotional and intellectual dimensions by imagining his or her perspective, not by assuming the other person's position. So there you have it. The imagination is key once again. One of, one of the great things you can do at Kent State University is to imagine something fabulous that can come to you out of books and learning. One of our first films that I think embodies this idea of how we can develop empathy is in the famous film, Beauty and the Beast. We know that Belle, our main character, is always in a book. She's in fact thought of as aloof and apart from the world in the first song of the film. The people don't understand why she's always off in other worlds, but really what we know she's doing is she's training her mind and her imagination to do exactly what empathy would require us to do. Imagine someone else's feelings. Imagine how then that comes in handy when she encounters a beast, someone not like her, someone with whom it's difficult to communicate, someone who's aggressive and violent at first. And yet we see in these beautiful images, and as we know in the film, she is able to conquer the heart and mind and imagination of this particular beastie character because she was able to have imagined herself in the world of many other perspectives as she was reading her books. You can see even here that the filmmakers did a wonderful job of having a woman inside a store with an open window but her perspective is limited only to that open window, whereas Belle, with her head in a book, is in the real world with a, limit, a limitless amount of perspectives available to her. And so this really codifies this image here from the film, a really great clash of perspectives, the limited stationary perspective of one person who can only see in one direction versus Belle, who's allowed herself to see in many. And that I think is what an English major can do, whether it's learning English language or English literature, the value and importance of literature we can see demonstrated here. Literature improves your command of language. It teaches you about the life, cultures, and experience of people in other parts of the world. It gives you information about other parts of the world which you might not be able to visit. It can entertain you. It makes you wiser. It helps you compare your own experiences with the experiences of other people. And it certainly allows you to understand things from other disciplines. And so when it comes then to thinking about a career, the world is an open book for you. Education, television, policy, advertising, being an author or a writer, proofreading. There are many pathways, therefore, for an English major. People could go on and teach English literature. You could be a librarian, but you could also do things that are non-traditional, like being a paralegal, for example, getting into law. We know that the writing skills are very important for English majors, and we can see, in fact, that they even are very successful in corporate uh, settings. So 50% of the graduates that chose a corporate career went to a large a corporation. It's very important to be able to speak well and to empathize with people when you're in a large corporation. So you could also work in public relations, nonprofit, technology. Basically, the book allows you to do any number of things, which means books hold all the magic. So now Mickey Mouse will get us to our next major by pointing to the next star in the sky by allowing us to understand the important skill set in intercultural communication of cultural worldviews and frameworks. This is a, a skill set that demonstrates a sophisticated understanding of the complexity of elements that are important to members of another culture in relation to its history, values, politics, communication styles, possibly economy or beliefs and practices. And our film is going to help us understand the way that knowledge of cultural worldview frameworks can be applied is none other than the Lion King. One of the great things about the Lion King is that it presumes that there's only one leadership style in the jungle, and that is that of the lion, of course. But we all know from the movie that Simba has an unfortunate series of, of events that lead him to be far off from his pride of lions, outside, therefore, of his typical cultural worldview no longer from the heightened perspective of the rock of the pride lands does he look down upon other cultures in the jungle, but 
he becomes a part of those other cultures, learning how to survive in a very different way with a warthog and a little, I don't know what Timon is, a little groundhog. So two very different animals. He takes advice then also from our famous Rafiki, someone who's not part of his worldview. And all of this training that he does by seeing someone else's worldview through different perspectives allows him to confront, even within his own community, a very different belief system. As we know, Scar thinks that the kingdom should be ruled one way, and Simba has to learn how to rule the kingdom in a different way. So being able even to come back from an experience where you've learned from other cultures and be able to renegotiate with people in your own culture that may or may not be successfully embodying leadership. This is what leads the film to be very successful. And as we see then at the end, it's a kingdom where you have more than one type of leadership power represented now on Pride Rock. You no longer have just lions, you have a whole pantheon of different perspectives. And in order to do this, when you think about what our students today are interested in, we think political science is a, is a great area where students can get this type of engagement. Keep calm and study political science. A lot of our students want to become leaders of corporations, of multinational corp uh, companies, of NGOs. And so when we think about the career of political scientists and all the different ways, they can either go into banking, they can go into real estate, they can go into journalism. You see in this image, the variability of someone to find a leadership position in any number of places in a very broad jungle, if you will. It's important therefore to be able to take on all of those different perspectives and to negotiate with people who are not from your own pride. So you get a really great map, therefore, of what a political science major could end up doing. Non-traditional jobs like being an economist, again, a paralegal, political campaign manager, all of that's very important because in each one of these roles, our students could find themselves confronted by things that are difficult for them to understand in a whole new world of engagement. Mickey now says we should transition on to something else. What about verbal and non-verbal communication? How often do we misunderstand some gesture or a word perhaps that's used in a context we might not understand? A skill set that you might want to learn that could come through some particular majors uh, asks us to articulate a complex understanding of cultural differences in verbal and nonverbal communication. So we can demonstrate an understanding of the degree to which people use physical contact while communicating in different cultures or direct and indirect or explicit or implicit meanings in different cultures. And we have to be able to skillfully negotiate those shared understandings based on those differences. One of the films that I think embodies this very well is Frozen. Of course, there's a lot to say about Frozen. Anna and Elsa are very able to communicate at an earlier phase in their childhood, right? They play well together, things are going great. And then all of a sudden disaster strikes and it separates the two of our characters. If you haven't seen the film, you might be the only people left on the planet who've not seen the film, but uh, spoiler alert, Anna and Elsa end up not communicating anymore. And it's Anna that goes regularly to Elsa's room, knocking on the door and asking her to come out and play. And unfortunately, she doesn't. She's locked now away in her own room, unable to communicate. And so part of what the film does is to teach us how to reach other people in verbal and nonverbal ways, how to find a doorway into someone whose door perhaps is closed off to us, and to, to keep at it, to keep trying, to demonstrate persistence and patience and perseverance when we feel we really can't get through to someone. And that ultimately resolves itself in the film when our sisters, once again, as you can see in this image, see eye to eye. One of the majors that we think can be really instructive in helping us to understand these skill sets is the psychology major after all. And one of the major skill sets that you can get with psychology is to understand people, how people think, how they learn, how they, how they affiliate with one another, what kind of conflicts can come to, as a result of human interaction. It allows you to assess things. It's a very analytical major. So you can then present your assessments to large groups. That helps you, of course, with interpersonal connection again on a larger scale. You can develop your own voice in writing, speaking, video, and online communications. And so the psychology major ties very well with the skill sets of intercultural communication. 
And then naturally, there are many jobs that you can partake in. You can be a psychologist or psychiatrist, but you can also very easily be an elementary, middle school, or even college professor. Psychology is so much a part of our lives today that there are any number of jobs where a background in human interaction and skill set sharing like this can be very important. All right, Mickey, what's next? Well, attitudes. Openness. Openness is another important thing we like our students to be able to learn at Kent State. This means initiating and developing interactions with culturally different others, as opposed to sitting in your own cultural group and maintaining that unified perspective uh, that all of you know each other and everything therefore is closed off. Instead to be open, suspending judgment about what you see happening in groups that are different from your own and valuing your interactions with culturally different others. A great example of this is the movie Toy Story after all. Now, Buzz Lightyear, one of our main characters, when he first enters into the world of Toy Story in the very first movie is convinced that he is a space cosmonaut. And therefore, when he comes to all different foreign people in different groups, the first thought he has is to dominate them or to eliminate them somehow. He's got his viewpoint about what the world means and he tries to impose it upon others. Of course, this doesn't work out well when he meets Woody who says to him, but you're a toy. You don't understand who you really are. So there's a big conflict here where both of these toys have to welcome each other into a different worldview to understand each other a lot better. And of course, that's filled initially with a lot of conflict, right? Woody becomes jealous of Buzz, who seems to have charmed everybody else, even though nobody else has told Buzz he's just a toy. And so what's great about this first uh, movie of Toy Story is that it involves a coming together and finding a middle ground between Woody and Buzz and those two perspectives where both of them need to learn to be open. And once they are open, they all of them can get together because at the end of the day, they all are toys, even though they're very different toys. Some toys are like piggy banks, other toys are squishy toys, uh, other toys are broken or missing pieces, and yet they all manage to get along with one another. And that becomes important because as you continue with the Toy Story films, you see some toys are very much uh, different than the traditional toy. The evil child Sid has destroyed his toys. It would be easy therefore to marginalize those that are not like us, that represent very different others. And yet Woody and Buzz together having been open and having experienced their own conflict earlier in the films become capable of working with these toys that don't seem like toys. And they end up being able to escape and confront their own worst nightmare as a group in the version of this evil child, Sid. One of the important majors we think can help with the understanding the skill set of openness is to major in anthropology. It's a diverse discipline, as you can see, that has a lot of different career opportunities, but that focuses on the human, the interaction, the histories, the cultures of all of us here and the many different ways we express those things. And there are many different career paths for a cultural anthropologist. You could go into academia or consulting or work for an NGO. You could do research work for social welfare, work for social justice. You could become a lawyer, a museum curator. Any job is, is open to you if you've studied the way that humans are interacting with one another. And you ask yourself, how could that be important if I'm a, an anthropology major? Don't I study history a lot or don't I study bones maybe? Uh, and what could that possibly do for me? Well, if you are part of a multinational company with an office in Moscow or Singapore or London or even Boston, you can see in this slide the very different ways in which culture informs interaction in a professional sphere. The person in Moscow has a very um, antagonistic feeling towards his or her boss. I need to make sure the boss has my back. The people in Singapore feel marginalized that even if they do manage to connect with some people, they can't seem to express themselves well to others. The people in London feel that they're the most diverse and that no one else understands the importance of their market. And then of course the people in Boston think that they're doing the most important work and they have all the access they need to their boss. Being able to navigate these important relationships and understand the cultural contexts for where our colleagues in other parts of the world are coming from is absolutely crucial. And as you've seen, 
And not only when dealing with toys and fantasy, but with dealing with real world problems, we need to be able to count on connect connecting and collaborating with others who are very different from us. All right, Mickey, what's next? Well, Color, this is for you. Attitudes, curiosity. How do we become curious and what inspires us to become curious? Well, that every major can allow us to do, right? It's an attitude curiosity. It's not a skill set meaning that we can take curiosity and apply it to anything and we can be nurtured by curiosity just about in any way. We should ask complex questions about other cultures, seeking out and articulating answers to these questions that reflect multiple cultural perspectives. One of the great ways to think about being curious is when we travel to think about the foods that we're exposed to, right? So for certain people, they might think that sushi, raw fish, is, a, is something they could never imagine eating. Others might imagine that blood sausage is something that they couldn't ever eat. But what about fried frog's legs? A lot of my American students see these very foreign food groups and they think to themselves, oh, those people in those places must really be weird to be eating those types of foods. And so what they do is they go to McDonald's or they go to Burger King or Kentucky Fried Chicken in every foreign nation in the world. And they are therefore no longer curious to try anything out because they want to go with the comfort foods that represent American culture. Of course, when I then say to them, what about these American foods? And could you imagine anyone from a different culture having a reaction to these very strange American foods like fried butter covered with chocolate and a caramel, salted caramel sauce? What about a hamburger with bacon and cheese that's sandwiched by two donuts for buns? What about this no named, very strange dish that looks like congealed pasta with a, a hot dog in the middle? These foods that may be normal to Americans and therefore don't elicit that ew, gross response are things that other cultures could see and really think are equivalent to blood sausage or fried frog's legs. So that represents an opportunity for students of all kinds to be curious and to try something. The worst thing that can happen, I tell them, is you go a little hungry for one day. Not the worst thing in the world, in other words. One of the examples now from a Disney franchise, somewhat new to Disney, that I think embodies this idea of curiosity is Baby Yoda. Baby Yoda from The Mandalorian, of course, who's eating everything. Of course, babies we know have a tendency to be curious. And so what university life should do for us is to help us return to that phase in our lives where we were not burdened by stereotypes or by presumption and where we were open and curious to all the newness that surrounds us, just like a child. And so Baby Yoda is always putting something in his mouth, whether it looks like a worm or a sea creature or whether it looks like a delicate French dessert. Sometimes food, of course, fights back in Baby Yoda's case and surprises him and he has to learn a lot of lessons about how to eat and what to eat. One of the problematic aspects of Baby Yoda's eating is that he likes to eat frogs and frogs' eggs. And whereas at the beginning of the series, he ate a frog and was told not to, and then swallowed it, burped, and laughed as a, as a way of saying, ha, I can do what I want. In subsequent scenes, that was challenged. He met children who didn't like the idea he was eating a frog, and so he spit it out. And then just when you think Baby Yoda had learned his lesson for good, not at all. The very next series of episodes featured Baby Yoda wrongly eating a series of frogs' eggs that he was told not to. So Baby Yoda's curiosity also has to be tempered or measured by an awareness, a situational awareness of how he's interacting with other cultures because there are appropriate and inappropriate exp expressions of curiosity. And so curiosity is perfect as a wonderful attitude, but it also has to be moderated somewhat by the other skill sets and the other attitudes that intercultural communication provides to us. All right, Mickey, what else you've got going on? We've got more knowledge, cultural awareness, and we're coming to the end of the presentation now, lest you think that I could go on forever and ever. Cultural awareness, articulating insights into your own cultural rules and biases is very important. Seeking complexity, being aware of how your experiences have shaped your own rules, how to recognize and respond to cultural biases, 
resulting in a shift of your own self description. Being able to see yourself, therefore, from different perspectives. If you can do this and the many other things we've discussed so far this morning very well, then you can become a global citizen, really ready to interact in a very diverse world. And you know that you're a global citizen once you start to see things in a fundamentally different way. And the, I love these perspectival tricks for that purpose. Is the cycle is holding on, about to fall down a, a long crevasse? No, perhaps it's just a matter of perspective. Is this person jumping in the air or again, falling in the middle of the sky? Is this a wall that divides us or is this a bridge or a pathway into a future of other understandings? So being able to shift your perspective and to choose how you perceive things is one of the hallmarks of being a global citizen. We see that very well here because now rather than just simply turning your head, what you see or don't see in these images is as a result of your own visual bias, right? Some of you might see on the far left, someone who's walking in an overcoat through a park. Some of you, however, might see the outline of a profile of a face where the underside of a bridge is really an eye. In the center of your screen, you might see a vase or a container of some kind, or you might see two profiles on either side of the image of a human face. Do you see an old woman or a young woman when you're seeing this image on the far right? You could either see this as an eye and this as a chin and a mouth of an old woman, or you could see this as an ear maybe and the jawline of a young woman. So imagine therefore that all of these bits of information that you are taking in are the knowledge points that you acquire at a university. You've studied your physics, you've studied your grammar, you've studied your maps in geography, and you know things. However, how you then see those things and communicate those things to others is the difference uh, in every way when it comes to interacting with our peers. So your information might have it that there's one way to look at climate change, Someone else's information, the same information, might make them look at climate change in a totally different way. How do you reconcile those perspectives and find a way of being able to make progress in collaboration? That's what a university is supposed to do. It's supposed to give you not only those bits of knowledge, but also the ways in which you can organize them and communicate them to others. And so when you then see things that look all the same, it allows you to understand right away that we shouldn't assume that these same hairstyles on three very different people from three very different parts of the world could mean the same thing. Once you become an educated global citizen, you know that you've got to really engage with those individuals as individuals and think about them within the context of their cultures and then work to be open and curious and empathetic and knowledgeable so that you can create a bond uh, instead of simply labeling what we think is going on from a superficial standpoint. That's how you know that you're educated, friends. Education in the end, says Martha Nussbaum, is not just about the passive assimilation of facts and cultural traditions, but about challenging the mind to become active, competent, and thoughtfully critical in a complex world. And once you've done that, you realize that you should never give up on all of those dreams and the many adventures that await for you, especially the adventure of coming to a great university like Kent State University, where we hope that you'll always let your conscience be your guide, that if you dream it, you can do it, and that at the end of the day, the future is yours in a really magical way. So with that, I'll conclude my comments for this presentation and open the floor up to any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen, for the wonderful presentation. And uh, now we open up for any comments and questions, thoughts on this. There's a lot of complexity with regard to, pair, to pairing a skill set with a major with a career, but I hope it was clear the way that our Disney characters embody success in doing that very thing. Thank you, Maria, and thank you, Marcos. I hope that your students and Diana, your students as well, and Ike, your students as well, will find this presentation helpful and that you found it helpful. I think sometimes it's hard um, to try and sell a car to someone by having that person look at a catalog of pictures of a car. I think that the better thing to do 
is to give you an opportunity to drive the car and to feel what it's like to be free on the road in your choice of a new vehicle. And from that standpoint, I hope that the presentation this morning today, which was not about what requirements there are in the majors, not about how many credits there are, about which classes you can take, that's the catalog. The presentation today was meant to be a test drive for you so that you can see the way that an educated person who is able to combine the skills, the major and the career interests can end up being a very successful student of the world and certainly an exceptional graduate of Kent State University. Absolutely. I also want to add on that uh, at Kent State, we're trying to provide the students a comprehensive experience. Liberal Arts and Science is one of the Kent core, uh, very Kent core requirement that we want students to be able to have. So even students from major like you know business communication, they're still able to actually they still require to take in Kent core classes that is selected from the courses from the College of Arts and Science. So that gives students comprehensive understanding on humanity, on mathematic, on arts, and uh, on ethics and various different kind of topics too. Kalu, that's a very important point. And I think that right now our students need help, all of our students need help to understand the way that the world is no longer linear. I don't think it ever was. But what I mean to say by that is a lot of students come to university and think that they need to choose a major because that will lead them to the only career that they will do for the next 40 years of their lives. And yet what we've seen with the pandemic is that people who may have only developed one interest or skill set while they were at university may have lost their jobs. Perhaps entire industries have gone out of business or entire careers are no longer possible. And so people use the word pivot a lot now as a way of turning toward and expanding possibilities. An education over a four year period should give you a quality of mind that allows you to be able to pivot forever because the idea that a 20 year old only knows things enough for one career in one position for one period of 20 to 40 to 60 years is unfortunate. And so whether you study business or whether you study public health or whether you study communications or you do something of pre-med, it's important to understand that the educated person is someone who can do all of the things for a job but all of the things to be able to change as life requires us to do when we're confronted with challenges in the future. So that speaks to the importance of the Kent core courses and the ability for students to engage with some of those very necessary skill sets, even beyond their choice of discipline and their intended career opportunity. See, I wasn't lying. She is a really excellent presenter, isn't she? <laughs> It's all in the hat. <laughs> the hat gives her all the magic, you know. It and does. Her mind too. <laughs> well, I'm going to put my email in the chat feature here in case any of you would like to email me personally for any more information or if you just would like to share your stories with me about the challenges you face in recruiting students or working with students at, at, in high school or at the university level. Um, I did my PhD in medieval Italian literature, so all of my friends are present on this conversation today from the Office of Global Education, and I think they're a little tired of me, so I'm looking for more friends. Feel free to write to me. I'd be happy to know all of you. <laughs> Thank you, Val, for not being tired of me. <laughs> they do pay you to say those things. <laughs> We pay her two dollars to say that today. So, <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> I also want to say, uh, so we run a high school counselor series to provide uh, the professional development opportunities for our friends overseas. This session, uh, this series, starting last year during pandemic, has actually been survived and thrived just throughout the last year. And then we run varieties of different kind of topics from the cultural to majors to academic to personal growth. And then, uh, so those sessions designed to help us, to, to let us to help our high school counselor friends, but also gave us opportunity to network with you guys who are, you know, from another country and we can't really see each other nowadays in person. 
And uh, another thing I also want to mention is uh, if you do have would like and stay university representative or one of our mission counselor to come in to give you students a presentation about our university to introduce our wonderful programs and uh, uh, excellent academic environment, do let me know. I will send a follow up emails to everyone who registered events uh, to give the recording of the session today. But also, you know, feel free to email me back if you uh, have any events happening on campus, would like us to participate, or we just would like us to do a fly visit to talk to students as well. And then those sessions are running monthly. So we probably gonna run another one for the May before the uh, summer hits. And then the next session is going to be focused on the career development of the students. And then we actually be able to invite a uh, career advisor from Kent State uh, uh, Career Service Center. So they will be able to come here to talk to students about importance of networking when they arrive in US. And uh, the registration link for that will be sent out uh, in May. So do watch for it. And uh, we hope you sign up for it. Okay. All right. Any additional comments, questions? If not, I think that concludes our session today. Thank you, Color. Have a magical day, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Christine, and thank you, everybody, for participating today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for everything. Have Thank a you. nice day. You're welcome. Nice Thank you. Great job, Kristen. Thank Always. you, Color. <laughs> I'll see you a little bit then. I'll see you later. Bye.